fast and furious, exciting, terrifying. We love to scare ourselves, push ourselves to the limit in so many ways. Off-road on a bike, whizzing down a bumpy track, or skiing as fast as you can down a black run. That feeling of free fall as you drop and your stomach comes out the top of your head is just the best thing ever. But how can you accelerate from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in a heartbeat? It's not particularly natural to go that fast. As a rational person, I should be wanting to go slowly and just live a boring life. But, you know, every now and again, it's fun. Think of an invention designed to keep dads out of trouble and families together. It connects nylon stockings with railways. It defies gravity, scares us, and we love it. Part of your brain is absolutely convinced you're going to die, whilst the other half of your brain knows that you're perfectly safe. The world would be a much less exciting place without roller coasters. Roller coasters have got an extraordinarily compelling something that we love or hate, or love to hate, but once ridden, never forgotten. Roller coasters were a defining feature of my childhood. I was obsessed with them. It starts off slow, and you don't know what's going to happen, and then you can see the path of it, and then you let go. I'm usually very, very terrified. In 2019, the roller coaster database had registered globally more than 5,000 coasters. In the same year, the theme park with the most was Six Flags Magic Mountain in the United States with 19 roller coasters. They offer an intoxicating, affordable, extreme kick that keeps us coming back for more. It's that exhilaration of wanting to experience speed and the thrill of the ride, but also a nervousness about whether you'll survive. The stomach-churning sensations of being thrown into the air or dropped from a height. What is it about roller coasters that excites us in our millions? And how did we come to invent this hair-raising ride? This is Bakken, near Copenhagen in Denmark, which claims to have been the world's first amusement park, dating back to 1583. Originally, its woodland location was a place for pagan festivals, and it's steeped in legend. Jugglers would pitch their tents and entertain the locals. There would be music and stalls with goodies for people to buy. By 1840, it was officially expanded with more permanent stalls. There was a steam carousel, curiosities to marvel at, and plenty of live music. In 1932, what was Europe's largest wooden roller coaster was installed at Bucken. But where did the idea for this great invention come from? Historians say that the origins of the roller coaster lie in 18th century Russia, where ice slides became hugely popular. They were specially constructed out of wood and covered with ice, creating a hill on stilts. You had to walk up one side and then enjoy the slide down the other. In the naturally freezing winters of Russia, the slides would have lasted for many months without melting. It seems we'll never grow out of this kind of simple fun. At this contemporary snow and ice festival in Harbin, China, 
people love the thrills and spills of sliding downhill on their backsides. The Russians had captured the essence of the thrill from sliding fast downhill, but the execution, using nothing but your bottom or possibly a crude toboggan, left room for improvement. The French claimed to be the first to add wheels to a rudimentary vehicle moving along a track. Le Montagne Russe à Belleville Russian Mountains opened in Paris in 1812. They sold these rides as Promenade Ariane, or aerial walks. The French had copied the Russian mountains, but adding wheels made them go much faster and added to the thrill of the ride. The car wheels ran in grooves on a fixed track to keep them in the correct position. The drawback in all early designs was getting the cars back up the hill. First, passengers had to climb lots of stairs, then attendants had to push the cars back to the top. But the ride would soon feel tame. It needed an X factor that would bring the customers back over and over again. It was the French again who unveiled a brand new concept in 1846, the centrifugal railway. This highly ambitious next step introduced a loop into the ride. The rider and car were released down the slope. They gathered enough speed to carry them around the circular loop and back up the opposite slope to dismount. Inventors were exploiting the power of momentum, but gravitational or g-force became a critical factor in the safety and feasibility of the ride. G-force is a measure of the force that you are experiencing either due to gravity or due to a sudden change in your direction. So right now, I'm experiencing 1G, thanks to the Earth pulling me down, and that's the, the, the normal feeling that we have. But roller coasters play with that um, and sometimes amplify it so that it feels like we're experiencing 3 or 4Gs. And you can also feel 0Gs, that's weightlessness, and even negative Gs, where the force is acting upwards. Speed is vital to create inertia, which presses your body to the inside of the loop as the train spins around. Because the path is circular, centripetal force is created. Essentially, that tells you what the acceleration has to be to stay on that path. Centripetal acceleration always points towards the center of the circle you're sort of going around. So in the case of the top, the overall force has to be pointing down for you to be following that sort of circular trajectory. Gravity's pointing down, so that's actually contributing. And if you're going fast enough, then also you'll be getting a push from the chair that you're in as well. And the fact that the chair is pushing you down means that actually you're pushing into the chair. So that's why you don't just fall out. Obviously, if the roller coaster weren't moving, then yeah, you're totally going to fall out. When the French ride was put to the test, the rider was said to have experienced such a delicious feeling that he wanted to try it again. But he was one of few. The speed of the ride and the tightness of the loop would have created a g-force in excess of that experienced by an astronaut taking off in a space shuttle. Totally unacceptable on a roller coaster by today's standards. Early roller coaster designers who wanted to try out using loops, originally used um, a perfectly circular shape for the loop. Uh, but they quickly discovered uh, that due to some funky laws of physics, uh, the physical effects on the riders were enormous. They would go from basically just the normal downforce of gravity to suddenly experiencing six Gs, which is sort of in fighter pilot territory. And then at the top, they would go to sort of zero Gs, and then they'd go back to six Gs again. And the human body just couldn't really take this. It was resulting in broken bones and all sorts of people passing out. We know a lot about how much gravitational force the human body can withstand, thanks to the extraordinary experiments carried out by an American Air Force flight surgeon called Colonel John Stapp. He put himself literally through torture experiencing a maximum g-force of 46.2. On the Holloman rocket sled, Staff reached the top speed of 640 miles per hour and 
slam to a full stop in 1.4 seconds. He was lucky to survive, though his sight was badly damaged. The centrifugal railway wasn't anywhere near as dangerous as Colonel Stapp's Air Force jet, but nevertheless caused injuries and made people feel ill. Roller coasters create g-force on the human body, and this can have a number of effects. It can make us feel lightheaded, it can make us feel dizzy, and in the most extreme circumstance, it can also make us pass out. The centrifugal railway never really caught on, disappearing almost as quickly as it had appeared. The upside-down idea wasn't crazy, but it needed finessing. The loop-the-loop -loop wouldn't make a successful comeback until the Americans tried designing an improved version. But that would take another 50 years. The latter half of the 19th century was boom time for technology and innovation, and Americans wanted their share of the action, which the Russians and French had set in motion. Early train technology was already established in the US. Carriages fitted with wheels were driven along rails. This method of locomotion inspired the creativity and ultimately the birth of the roller coaster as we know it. It's a world in which Things are speeding up. Industrial techniques are, 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 are available to large swathes of population. It's a world in which, because things are speeding up, um, time and space are, as it were, being crunched together. So it's an age in which people are traveling further and faster than ever before. The world is shrinking. Um, but uh, it's also a world of, of, of some anxiety about what that means. The inspiration for the first American roller coaster had a humble start in a small mining town in Pennsylvania called Mock Chunk. In 1846, a new circular routed railway was installed, hauling empty coal wagons uphill by stationary steam engines and sending fully laden ones back downhill using only the momentum of gravity. The fact that the track was a circuit gave it the name Switchback. It traveled back and forth. When the miners didn't need it, this modest little train became a tourist ride. People loved the speed of rolling downhill fast, but it wasn't a roller coaster yet. The story goes that a certain Lamarcus Thompson visited the Pennsylvania Switchback Railway for this germ of a thrill ride to be taken to the next level. The roller coaster as we know it today owes a great deal to ladies' stockings. When nylon stockings went on sale to the American public in 1939, women flocked to stores in their thousands to get their hands on a pair. Four million pairs were sold in just four days. By Christmas, ladies, three million dozen pairs will be on the market. This can be partially attributed to inventor Lamarcus Adna Thompson, who created a device to manufacture seamless ladies' stockings. The hosiery business paved a road to great wealth but poor health meant early retirement for Thompson. He chose to spend his time designing something rather different. Thompson began working on a number of roller coaster patents, capitalizing on the work already achieved by an engineer named John G. Taylor, who had such patents to his name as the inclined railway and the anti-rollback device which causes the clank as you go up the lift hill, preventing the cars from rolling backwards. But it was Lamarcus Thompson who would be crowned the father of gravity and credited with inventing America's first roller coaster, a moment in history from which we have never looked back. In 1884, Thompson's Gravity Pleasure Switchback Railway opened in a new holiday resort in Brooklyn, New York City. Seen here in the early 1900s, it was called 
Coney Island. That first Coney Island coaster was about 180 meters long and ran in a straight line featuring a brake or rollback device. It was this beautiful old wooden thing that supposedly its top speed was six miles an hour. Would have been faster to just run down it, but hey, you know, you gotta start somewhere. Despite a snail's pace of just under 10 kilometers per hour, the Switchback Railway was a huge success, with queues several hours long. It was the start of something big on Coney Island. Before long, three amusement parks had opened in that one town at the turn of the 20th century. Steeplechase Park, Luna Park, and Dreamland. New Yorkers and others flocked like bees to a honeypot over the decades. It was a seaside resort offering so much fun, as celebrated in this 1940 film. Coney Island, the world's greatest fun frolic, with its beach miles long, all peppered with people. Let's mingle with one million folks, folks who are just like all of us, 100,000 youngsters and oldsters, all swimming, playing, or resting, all getting their share of the sun and the fun. With amusements here, there, and everywhere, it's hard to decide where to start. Rivers of humanity in carnival mood pour through Coney's many streets. Here in this great whirlpool of joy, here for a lark at Coney Island, world's biggest barrel of fun. Being around at the time of the birth of the roller coaster must have been incredibly exciting. Human beings, by their very nature, are novelty seekers. We like the new and the shiny, and also the thrill and excitement. It might seem obvious why roller coasters were invented. Pure thrill, the speed, the illusion of danger. But it seems there was more to it than that the fight against immorality. Pure thrills were not the motivation for Thompson. He saw an opportunity to keep people outside in the fresh air and together as families, away from the temptations of the devil. Perhaps his intention was to bring families together to do a, a, a joint activity. Because here you ha have a time where perhaps men had all the freedom, held all the cards, could go out gambling, drinking, and maybe womanizing, and women were left literally holding the baby. And perhaps his thinking was, you know, this is something people can do together, but actually offers the thrills and spills that, you know, will stop men seeking pleasure elsewhere. Thompson was a religious man and wanted to invent something to distract people, particularly wayward fathers, from ending up gambling, in taverns, dancing halls, or worse, brothels. It stemmed from a basic concern about the prosperity Americans were enjoying after the Civil War. He feared the world around him was turning towards a debauched society. There's a consciousness that people are getting more holidays, that they've got some more disposable income, and there's a fear that that will lead people into bad behavior, into drinking, into licentiousness, and into particularly men behaving badly. On the other hand, critics of the early roller coaster, who were as pious as Thompson, did not approve of the invention. I mean, some people disapprove of it hugely, particularly uh, large numbers of preachers and religious teachers at the end of the 19th century are highly, highly opposed to the idea of thrills for thrills' sake, because it's not serious. It's, 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 it's avoiding real life. It's avoiding real issues. But their views did not stand in the way of progress. The roller coaster basics were in place, 
but there was room for improvement. Man is always wanting to go faster, further, higher, and it's no different with roller coasters. I think roller coaster design engineers, they want their passengers to get a greater thrill beyond anything they've designed so far. Drawing boards began to fill with new possibilities, pushing the bar and stretching technology. Designers were well aware that riders would soon grow tired of the same old track, the same old cheap thrill. They'd be hungry for something bigger, better, faster, scarier. So how did we get from this to this? For all the sophistication and possibilities in the modern world of roller coasters, that clank, smell, and feel of a wooden ride gives people a warm feeling of nostalgia. In 2018, Wickerman opened at the UK's Alton Towers, specifically to satisfy the die-hard traditionalists who love wood. But everything else about it is state-of-the-art. There seems to be a bit of a, a rebirth of wooden roller coasters within the theme park industry. There seems to be something about them that actually it really excites people, this kind of retro piece of hardware. It shakes, it rattles. It, it feels more natural and organic in the way that it, it runs. Every ride is slightly different. So where you sit the front and the back or the middle, uh, on the left or the right, it's always kind of a different experience. We've also used lots of other special effects, so lighting, smoke, and projections um, to help convey a story, to create that atmosphere. The concept of this particular 21st century ride brings an immersive experience so that it is more than just another coaster. It plays with riders' fears in an imaginary pagan ritual. Safety is, of course, crucial on all Daredevil rides. The cleverness of their design makes them look dangerous and yet we know they are not if we follow the rules. You know at the back of your mind that this is a safe way to get a thrill. And seeking that thrill, if you like, is the psychological reward. That is the reward in itself. I want to get a thrill. I want to get a buzz out of it. I want to get an adrenaline rush. That's what's going on in the brain. But I know at the end of it, you know, I'm going to be okay. This ride is safety checked every morning. Two technicians walk the track from beginning to end, inspecting every joint, every bend, every nut and bolt, looking for any signs of stress or anything wrong. After this initial check, the ride is under constant scrutiny from the control room throughout the day. IAAPA, the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, state that safety is the number one priority for the industry and its 6,000 members in more than 100 countries. To reduce risks of injury, there are rules. A standard height for riders of every ride in every park is clearly signposted. Riders shouldn't use mobile phones, which could be dropped and then hit someone. Restraints keep riders in the correct position so they won't harm themselves. But accidents do happen occasionally. In this park, five gondolas became detached from their rails on an upside down bend in 2016. Nine people were injured most of them children, two of them seriously. To put this into context, injuries are rare. You're much more likely to be struck by lightning or be injured in your car ride to and from the park. There's no hiding that the early days of amusement parks were a risky business. Spinal injuries were reported, people felt ill, and many rides didn't last long because they weren't safe enough or were too uncomfortable. Riders were effectively guinea pigs, 
as designers tested the boundaries of what speeds and curves and falls humans could comfortably endure. That first switchback railway on Coney Island quickly replenished LaMarcus Thompson's coffers following his $1,600 investment. Charging five cents a ride, he was in profit in less than three weeks. So industrialization is such a dynamic and such an uncontrolled experience that it enables early innovators to make a huge amount of money. So Thompson and his roller coaster, one can find endless examples of people who have a really good idea and capitalize upon it. Within four years, Thompson was given 30 more coaster-related patents. Imitations and improved new designs were quick to follow. As progress gathered pace, and people tried out exciting leisure activities in every shape and form. It's exactly at the same time that you're beginning to see, for example, downhill skiing develop, which was not something that existed before the late 19th century, which people have to learn to like. And they learn to like it in the same way people learn to like roller coasters, because it's modern, because it speaks to some desire to lose control a little bit, and because it's, it's about speed. But fundamentally, how could engineers push the envelope, make the rides much more exciting? An inventor called Lina Beecher worked on the French loop idea. Maybe with modifications, could it work without making people feel sick? Before the flip-flap opened to the general public, it underwent crude safety testing on sandbags and monkeys. In 1895, Flip Flap opened on Coney Island, the first American coaster to turn riders upside down. It certainly provided the thrill designers were striving for, and the public were getting the hang of doing something scary for fun. I think it's great to have escapism in, in our lives so that we're not just ground down by routine and doing the same boring thing every day, because I think human beings like novelty seeking and, and doing something like going on a roller coaster can provide that. Although the monkeys and sandbags had done their job, the extreme G-force gave human riders whiplash and other injuries. Ultimately, the flip-flap was a flop. But Beecher didn't lose heart. The idea just needed finessing. Before long, his next version called Loop the Loop, opened on Coney Island in 1901. What he'd figured out was that redesigning the loop from circular to tear-shaped, technically called a clothoid loop, would dramatically decrease the G-force. They were trying to look at a way of doing it in a more tapered sense, so you would get the acceleration to get a sort of loop, but not put it through such intense G-forces and extremes in G-forces through that. So the way they do that is it's actually it's very tapered. So you start off with a very long radius of curvature and it slowly gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You get to the top and then it goes back again. So you end up getting this sort of teardrop shape, this clothoid loop as it's known. And it's really just to temper the G-forces but still give you that same sort of experience. But loop the loop didn't last long. The elliptical loops were still too tight for most to stomach, and it closed for safety reasons. It was followed by Drop the Dip, considered to be the first true thrill ride. When we go quickly, we get a sudden surge of adrenaline which is released into the body. And the adrenaline can have a number of different effects on the human body. It makes our heart rate go quicker. It causes blood to be distributed to our muscles. It causes our pupils to dilate. It makes us feel more energetic, more powerful. And all of these feelings together are exhilarating and pleasurable for the individual. It is very primal, even though, you know, it's not particularly natural to go that fast. You know, as a rational person, I, sh you know, I should be wanting to go slowly and just live a boring life, but, you know, every now and again, it's fun. 
Adrenaline junkies think it's fun to throw themselves at all sorts of hair-raising challenges. Bungee jumping can inflict a g-force of three, for example. Or downhill skiing, where it's possible to reach over 250 kilometers per hour. The man credited as the father of the modern high-speed roller coaster was American engineer John A. Miller. He started out working for LaMarcus Thompson before collaborating with others and designing his own rides. Miller was prolific, contributing to around 140 coasters around the world during his long career. What he managed to achieve was higher hills than ever before, like his legendary Big Dipper, which opened in Blackpool in the UK in 1923, seen here in 1960. 3,000 feet in length with cars traveling at 30 miles an hour guarantees a thrill of thrills. Let's go! Miller had huge vision, pushing against all the engineering rules of the time, with more extreme highs and lows and sharper turns to intensify the thrills. So you're trying to accelerate the vehicle at high speed. You're trying to turn passengers upside down. You're wanting to drop them from the height. These are all mechanical challenges because you're playing with acceleration, friction, gravity, the switch between potential energy, which you gain from raising something to a height, or kinetic energy, which comes from dropping something at speed. Miller also invented the safety chain dog, or safety ratchet. A more foolproof mechanism to stop a car or train rolling back downhill if the chain that pulls it up the hill were to break. It's a device that evolved and is still widely in use today. But a hundred or so years later, two loops just wouldn't be enough to satisfy the fans. This coaster was the world's first to have a staggering 14 loops. It travels at up to 85 kilometers per hour and doesn't ever hold up from thrilling its passengers. With every super fast drop, there's a sensation that makes roller coaster lovers keep coming back for more. Fans call it air. Airtime is sort of a, a holy grail for ride designers because that's what's, what gives you this feeling of being in space for a second, of, of finally being weightless. And it's this incredible sensation in your stomach where it's just like, <gasps> It takes your breath away. And then it'll all suddenly come rushing back to you when you reach the bottom of the drop. So yeah, I'm an airtime junkie and I think most roller coaster fanatics are too. It's a sensation that makes us feel frightened and excited at the same time. But what exactly is happening inside our bodies? Well, we get a, the heart and the mouth feeling on a roller coaster because as we accelerate and, our, and as we decelerate, our organs in our body also accelerate and decelerate. And with the play of gravity on the body, it does create this weird sensation of literally having a heart in your mouth. And what is going on inside our heads? I think we also have the wiring for that kind of fight or flight that goes on with us, where, you know, we get into a situation like our ancestors did, where they didn't know if they were going to make it or not. And I think some of that hard wiring is still there. And it's been turned into, if you like, um, a pleasurable situation where you can get those, all those sensations without it ending badly. In the end, coasters exist to make money. Ride designs must stay ahead of the curve to survive in a highly competitive world. And the competition isn't just from other parks. People are at home sitting on their computers or on their phones, and we have to make sure we're creating experiences that actually goes, you can only do this here, you can't do this at home, and you want to come and experience that. And that's what we're competing against, is home technology, but how do we do better here at our theme parks with rides and attractions people can experience? At little cost, fans can design and ride roller coasters using a computer game in fact, 
they can design their perfect virtual amusement park with as many coasters as they can dream up, all in the comfort of their home. So the real thing has to work doubly hard to create hype and bring in the business. Each new ride must be more exciting than the last, more exciting than any other ever. Its USP has to make it stand out from the crowd and thrill people before they even try the ride. The oldest roller coaster still operating today is this one, Leap the Dips, which opened in 1902 in Lakemont Park, Pennsylvania. A bastion of American coaster heritage and a fast and furious roller coaster world. With careful restoration and a large spoonful of nostalgia, it's become a timeless classic. By the roaring 1920s, around 1,500 roller coasters were in operation in America alone. They were often the big attraction that pulled customers into the growing amusement parks, which also numbered as many as 2,000 at that time. Roller coasters symbolized modernity and technology, which were compelling to a young affluent clientele. The Cyclone Coaster opened on Coney Island in 1927. It's become a classic that's still open today, with 12 drops and reaching a speed of 95 kilometers per hour. It's built on the site of that first switchback railway of LaMarcus Thompson's. It was nearly demolished in the 1970s after an estimated 10 million people had ridden it. But New Yorkers' love of nostalgia won the day, and it survived until now. It also survived the ups and downs of the world around it. The Great Depression hit amusement parks badly in the 1930s. People no longer had the spare cash or the humor for the frivolous pursuit of pleasure. Attractions closed left and right. And by the mid-1930s, only 400 parks were able to keep going across the United States. As World War II left its painful scars, many parks and rides were done for. Those that did cling on were down, but they weren't out. Roller coasters would rise again with so much potential ahead of them to become more thrilling, more scary, more exciting. Soon after the war was over, amusements, and in particular roller coasters, entered a new era that catapulted them towards an incredibly bright future. It was down to a brand new American invention, the theme park. The world's first theme park is believed to have been opened in Santa Claus, Indiana in 1946. The difference from earlier amusement parks was its singular theme which inspired all the content. In this case, all things North Pole and Christmas. However, it was really another American whose vision changed everything. Mickey and I started out the uh, first time many, many years ago. We've had a lot of our dreams come true. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. That's it, right here. Disneyland. In 1955, Disneyland opened in California and set a bar that those who followed tried to emulate. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here age relives fond memories of the past. And here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future, with the hope that it will be a source of joy to all the world. 
The vision was one of good, clean fun in a closed, controlled, and safe environment. One entry ticket would buy access to all rides instead of paying as you go. It's again about the industrialization of leisure, if you like. Just as our new car has to be better than the one before it, just as our new phone has to be better. And so roller coasters are subject to the same laws of industrial, commercial life as anything else. It shows us that there actually isn't such a sharp break between leisure and industry as all that. Roller coaster development became entwined with newly available materials, advances in design and technology, and an appetite for even bigger thrills. In 1959, Matterhorn bobsleds opened at the Californian theme park, the first to be built with nylon wheels and more flexible steel tubular rails instead of inflexible wood. These features made the coaster instantly more comfortable to ride. Comfort was improving, speeds were getting faster, and knuckles were whiter as rides galloped towards the unprecedented growth we are seeing today. Theme parks began to crop up around the world, inspired by Walt Disney and his pioneering idea. And that meant a growing demand for rides, and particularly roller coasters. Many parks don't have naturally undulating terrain. So engineers have designed ways of launching coasters on the flat, like this one. It does zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.5 seconds, catapulted by a hydraulic launch system. Another comparable system, the launch induction motor, uses electricity to energize the motor, which produces a magnetic wave. So this is a linear induction motor. An induction motor is usually round. Um, obviously, we've laid it out flat, hence it's called a linear motor. Um, you can see the copper here and the steel core. So this is inside this black coating, which is there to protect the copper when it's on an amusement ride. When we energize this, we get a magnetic field. This is a piece of aluminium, and this reacts against the magnetic field. So if I switch this on. It's based on an invention by Croatian-born Nikola Tesla in 1887. You can see this with this example here. I'm holding the disc a couple of centimeters away from the surface. As I move closer towards the motor, the magnetic field interacts with the disc. The benefits of these launch mechanisms mean a different thrill to the ups and downs of conventional roller coasters and super fast propulsion without relying on gravity. By the 1970s, it was boom time again for roller coasters, and family fun was the priority. One of the standout rides became the Great American Revolution, which opened in Six Flags Magic Mountain in 1976. Revamped a few years ago, Revolution claims to be the world's first 360-degree looping coaster, with a full vertical loop that hadn't been accomplished before. I mean, they're just so fun. I mean, it's that sense of speed, the G-forces where, where you, 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 know, you get squashed down into your seat or you feel sort of weightless, the, the wind sort of blowing in your face. Uh, and, you know, all the innovations you see now with, like, corkscrews and going upside down, and, like, they really put a lot of thought into how to make this the most exhilarating ride of your life, even though it's only, like, a few minutes. We are living in a theme park boom, with most growth in the Asia-Pacific region and Europe. By 2025, the global market is predicted to be worth over $70 billion. China is forecast to overtake the rest of the world in terms of size of theme park facilities. That means the industry there will have more than tripled within 10 years, all thanks to the Chinese middle class having more money in their pockets in a prosperous economy. 
In 2017, Chinese theme parks had half a billion visitors. What's more extraordinary is that amusement parks didn't even exist in China before the 1980s. Roller coasters can play a vital role in attracting customers to parks, especially if they're breaking a record. Formula Rasa in Abu Dhabi reproduces the thrill of being in a racing car, but on a roller coaster. In 2019, it remained the world's fastest ride, achieving 0 to 240 kilometers per hour in just 4.9 seconds. Riders experience a body-slamming surge of 4.8 Gs on this coaster, close to that maximum 5 Gs that most people can tolerate. Roller coaster design engineers are wanting to push the limits, always with the human physiology in mind, because you know you can take a ride to greater than five G forces, but you'd be putting the passengers at risk. And there's always this fine balance of pushing designs to their extreme whilst keeping people safe, and that will continue to be an engineering challenge. But the physical thrill of G-Force might be a thing of the past, with rides providing a more cinematic experience. At moments in the ride, you can speed it up when something might be chasing you, then we might slow it down and do something where you're doing a bit more of a story-led experience. Making guests feel like things are moving or the car is responding to events that are happening around them. The sounds, even the smells, everything, as many senses we can kind of touch to the guests, I think that's where we will start heading towards. The potential problem for amusement in theme parks is that to enjoy some new virtual rides, you don't need to go to a park at all. There's a much cheaper alternative in VR centers like this, with motion reality booths that take riders on a roller coaster with all the thrills of the real thing, without the lines or G-force to worry about. The future seems as big as our imaginations will allow it to be. Since its invention, the roller coaster has mirrored the world itself. Starting off at not much faster than walking pace, it has become progressively faster and scarier. Never content with ordinary, we've pushed to the extraordinary. We've hurtled towards an ever-disappearing finish line. We've learned to deliberately scare ourselves witless and come out smiling. A roller coaster is designed to challenge your very basic human responses of fear. And that's where the thrill comes from. That feeling of free fall as you drop and your stomach comes out the top of your head is just the best thing ever. They're just the ultimate thrill to me. And we've managed to create a safe escape from a modern world that frustrates and enrages us with an invention that surprises and uplifts us. And for so many of us, is absolutely thrilling. The roller coaster's such a great invention because what it does is bring a little bit of magic into ordinary life.